think I need. Okay, your lighting looks great, by the way. Good. Now mm -hmm. you can call this off, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We all we always cut all this off. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna uh, hold on. I'm gonna go get my uh, phone. I'll be right back. Okay. I'm back. You can leave. Lynn, your inter your internet connection's good. It seems to be fine. Okay. So I will if, also and, I will also make someone else co-host. Okay. And anyone who wants to show or share screen has to be made a co-host. Okay. And this That's is set up just like your district meeting where you can pull people in from the panelist room if you want to. I'm gonna ask the uh I'm making Kathy a co-host because she's going to show a video. Yep. And as soon as the hosts, uh, district hosts show up, I'll ask if they want to pull people in or not. But Perfect. I can do it. And if they can't come in, it's probably because they aren't using an updated version of Zoom. Right. And you have my cell phone number. If anything gets knocked out, you can just text me and I'll restart everything. Got well, it. And if Thank Kathy you. gets knocked out, what will you do, Angela? Well, I'll cry a little bit. <laughs> Just so you know, Kathy, we're recording. Okay. It's a, uh, it, it, that was a little bit of a joke. That yes. Was, what, what I, I heard it? it. I heard it as that, too. <laughs> what do we do if Kathy gets knocked out? No, you cannot get knocked out right now. Right. Exactly. I will continue to pack for our very early flight to West Palm Beach. So. Great. I, I will see you all next Wednesday. Oh, Enjoy. Enjoy. Thank you. Be well. Bye, Thank Angela. You. Thanks. Is that Angela leaving? Yes, because yes. I am now mistress of the show. Oh, my gosh. You want to hand the reins over? No, I'm I'm fine. Uh, well, I'm, the, I'm the host. I'm going to make you a, a co-host, right? Great. But let me ask you. Um, do you bring people in who are in the audience? Want to, yes. Okay. Do you ask them, uh, the way we do it in District 2, we say, please raise your hand if you'd like to come in. If we see a suspicious name, we quiz them before we bring them in. That's fine. Okay, great. <clears throat> so, Kathy, we're now going to do a, a um, the thing on the 25th sixth at the middle school yeah i just i'll need i need to mike is i think he's overwhelmed with other things but anyway um that works well for me now so even if dorothy and jennifer 
say yes to, you know, a 20 minute or 15 minute cameo appearance. Um, <laughs> I was only thinking of an hour and a half. This is Pam, we're talking about doing a, a town wide kind of panel, but same presentation at the middle school during in person on a, a Sunday afternoon so that people who want to come rather than be on Zoom. Um, oh, good. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, it would be similar to what you're seeing now, but the, I, the what I thought is I'd add someone maybe from ECAC if they want to oh. join to talk about the school, the net zero, the climate side. And we'd make sure someone from the school is talking about the education side. So, you know, so so it's it's very similar. It's just a little bit more of a panel and come with questions. Yep. Come with questions, come with a discussion. Um, so. so Kathy, do you know what times yet? Well, the the Dorothy and Jennifer had a two to four thirty slot set up. Right. So want it if they say, uh, you know, if they said, for example, Kathy, why don't you show up at four? you know, at the end of our meeting, mm -hmm. then we could make that two to three thirty. Okay. I was thinking no more than an, an hour and a half. I mean, unless you. Nope. I think that's perfect. And if they said they'd rather have me come at the very beginning, you know, I could flip it, but I I'm, I'm thinking I would just propose to them, you know, so to, and Sean already had it on his calendar and Tammy had said she was going to try to come to them so i thought this this actually is a convenient misunderstanding because mm -hmm. that afternoon wasn't available before does that does that all make sense to you Lynn? Yep. okay so i'm just writing it down march 26 2 to 3 30. okay and is that your open house meeting date is is march 26? 26, yep, an open house, anybody come, um, you know, the, the place is big enough that if, you know, you could bring, if you have teenagers, I mean, you could bring people, you know, it could be a family. We, we got asked during the forum whether we couldn't hold it in a physical space on the weekend so families who work and have kids could come. Um, you know, including the adult kids who would otherwise be feeding. Do you want to give a brief um, statement about that and the, give the date so people know from this sure. presentation? Sure. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll do it. If I forget, Pam, just remind me the, the very last slide of this pack. And I, will, I can now, by not including, the video makes this a huge thing, but if I just save it, as a PowerPoint chart, the video just becomes a picture, yep. but I can give you the chart back, but I can add that when I do for more information, go to this website. And I said, there's also going to be this town wide. It's not on the chart right now because we hadn't set it up, but okay. And what did you call it? An open house? I open called it house. open house, but I didn't know if that's what you're- that's a, It's all right. Open house, a panel or whatever at the middle school. <laughs> okay. Anika. Good evening, Anika. Hi, Anika. Hello. We already Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to mute myself to get rid of background noise. I'm bringing Sean Mangano in. Super. Which of you, which of you wants to talk about budget? Uh, if if Sean's a... here, he will. If not, either Paul or I will. Okay. Right? Sean. Hi, Paul. Hi, everybody. Welcome do to we, District 4. Do we want so me? nice here? I like it. <laughs> it's a nice part of just town. Wait. Oh, uh, yeah. Do you want me to bring people in as they show up or wait till we kind of are at the seven o'clock mark? Um I would we are we are open, we are already open to the public. We are, and we're already we are already uh video uh taping. Yeah. We are. Yes, we are. Who hit record? Uh, uh, Angela, before she turned the controls over to me. Wonderful. I was I was about to hit record and I would have stopped it. Yeah. <laughs> so we have Judy and we have Sandy Knightley in the audience. So. 
so the the thinking is that that I'm going to introduce Kathy and the elementary school program and the presentation. Um, and then with questions afterwards, and we'll just raise hand, people can raise hands and ask questions about the school. And then I'm going to ask the question, would you like to be, you know, get your face up here on the screen and people can raise their hands and we can pull them in. And if you'd like to help with that, that would be lovely. I figured yeah. that was my job for tonight, but if you want to do it, I'm more than happy. I am here to help. I'm here to give Angela a break. Wonderful. She's packing I did, for vacation. I expect Angela to have to do that. Thank you, Lynn. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and Sean and Paul for being with us. Thank you. Yeah. Happy to. And of course, you, Kathy, for doing the rounds with everybody. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Where would you host your meeting if it was in person? Is there a, a logical place you normally host them? Oh, we've done a couple places. We went to the History Museum mm -hmm. and had a wonderful gathering there. Um, Lynn was also there with us. Yeah, the Senior Center. Senior we've Center. Senior Center. And we're looking at the Amherst College Library for our next meeting, which is happens to be, coincidentally, the host for Ancestral Bridges exhibit. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. What day are you looking at? Well, we haven't decided that yet. Not to we're change getting, topics. We're getting but... through this meeting first, <laughs> and then we talk about the next meeting. Not to change topics, but Anika, whatever happened to that bear situation? <laughs> You're muted. I can't hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so excited. I didn't unmute. So thank you for asking. I actually have to reach out to Dave Waddles again and find out when is he coming because it's getting warmer. Yeah. And oh, warmer, yeah. and he did respond. I don't know if you saw it by saying that they he couldn't confirm, but that they could very well be there because the yearlings were there last year, and so they would be two years and now denning by themselves. So, we'll, so it's un unresolved, is uh, the current it's un situation. It's unresolved, okay. but I will certainly send out the, the memo whenever <laughs> I hear the day that someone will come. Thank you. So, Anika, Anika, when you're talking with Dave Waddles, will you ask where he thinks? that she denned over the winter, we would love to know. Yes. Oh, you mean in your backyard? <laughs> well, we didn't see her last last fall the way we saw her several times before and we, we missed her. Is oh. David the, the individual who tracks them, who has the, I remember I heard the presentation, I didn't see it, but I heard yes, about he, that. Yes, this is the, the, same, the same one. It's there, I would definitely recommend taking a look at it. It was, it was pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. So Pam, I don't know that um, I thought I sent you that email. So there are some interesting structures in my yard and it looks like they could be there, but I, I've made a fence with twigs and leaves and I may have like, un unknowingly made a, a condominium for little and big creatures. <laughs> yeah. I could send my resident bear biologist to go visit. That me. would be, yeah, you, that's right. That's right. Okay, so it's about it's just after seven, and, and there have are five people. There are five people in the audience, and so I'm going to start by saying welcome to District Four. Um, I somehow got out of assigning myself a job to do tonight, so I'm the facilitator. Um, so tonight we are going to have a couple of um, items of interest, and the first one will be with Kathy Shane, who is the chairperson for the elementary school building committee. And she has a really great presentation on the elementary school schematic design, what the building is going to be, is starting to look like. Then we're gonna open it up for questions and answers uh, relative to the school and so forth. And then we thought we would transition from that to talking about the, uh, we have some folks that want to talk about the school from a parent perspective, and they're for, from a group called Yes for Amherst Schools. And at some point, someone from that group will be asked to speak for a couple of minutes on the topic. Then we will transition to budget. We have both Lynn Griesmer, who is on the Finance Committee, Kathy Shane, who's on the Finance Committee, and Sean Mangano, who is the Director of Finance uh, for the town. And we also have Paul Bachelman, Town Manager, who um, 
know the budget inside and out and can give a quick overview of what's happening as well as answer questions. So um, at, at before, be, after, after Kathy Shane gives the elementary school presentation, we're going to open it up and ask if folks want to come in with their with their faces visible to the audience here and join in the conversation. Um, and we would be very happy for people to, you know, just be here present uh, in the conversation. So we have six attendees and it's a little after three, I mean, three after seven. Um, I'm hesitant to have Kathy start her presentation too soon so that people don't miss it. Pam, real quick, um, Kathy, is is um, Tammy Sullivan Daly part of the presentation tonight? Should she be a panelist? Um, yes. Okay. I did. I just promoted her. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Principal Tammy Sullivan Daly, just to actually be official. Sorry. I didn't recognize the name. Permanent principal. Permanent principal. Forever. Well, congratulations. <laughs> That means you're not allowed to leave, by the way. It's a 10 year commitment. So, <laughs> year one. That's great. Nice to have you with us. Um, Kathy, do you want to start your, your presentation? Sure, that would be great. And just so everyone knows, you're, as I bring up the presentation, um, both Tammy and Sean will be joining me. Um, Sean has a specific set of charts and Tammy, we haven't rehearsed this, but there's a point when we're doing the virtual tour, if you can say a little bit about the way those classroom spaces, what, what's exciting about the design of the school, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, so I have permission to share. Is everyone, does everyone see this? Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to join you tonight. Um, this is a series of presentations we're doing, and I'll talk about an opportunity if you want to bring people with you to hear more at the end about the new elementary school. And we really see this as that we're building for our future. And as I'll emphasize, it's all of our future. This is a rendition um, by Dinesco Design, who are our fabulous architects for the school. I'm going to give a general overview of the elementary school, the building, the site, and uh, get into project costs and financing. And at that point, Sean will join me because the although we are expecting a sizable grant from the school granting authority, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, uh, we have a large town share to fund. That's scheduled for a May 2nd vote on a debt exclusion. If that moves forward, the school construction will start and we expect the school to open in 2026. And this is what I'm presenting tonight is the product of a large group of people, a building committee working with a designer and an owner's project manager. For an overview of what we're talking about when we say an elementary school, this new school will replace Fort River and Wildwood with one school. We're, we're downsizing the number of elementary schools. It's going to serve 575 students, kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, because the sixth grade is due to move up to the middle school. And you can see the configuration. It's we, We've got a very efficient building with a three-story building, two grades on each floor. And when you see the visuals, you'll see what I'm talking about with it's a design to have daylight filled classroom and activity room with a very flexible design that will allow the teachers and staff to be using it over time in different ways. It will be home to the dual language program and the special needs programs. It's going to be at the Fort River Strike, And one of the advantages of that is we can build the school while the current school stays open. The site plans have a lot of outdoor learning space as well as play, and we'll be restoring and providing drainage for the community fields, which are widely used. As importantly, this is a net zero school, the town's first building that will be net zero, which this means is it's an all electric system with ground source heat pumps with solar panels generating renewable energy and a very efficient building. 
A few take homes when we look at the whole project. Um, the project is first and foremost an education project. It's a new elementary school that was student centered. Teachers were very involved in informing the design. How are the classrooms laid out? How do we lay out the outdoor area? The three floor layout supports, and Tammy is the one who made this point, supports cross-age and shared project space in a way that will be very flexible in daylight-filled classrooms. This net zero design means it will be a model for the town, but also for our elementary kids. They're going to be in a school that is new and different, where they can study the environment by participating in it. Highly efficient building, and we expect to get um, nearly 2 million, 1.6 million from Eversource because we're using geothermal and we have targeted an energy efficient building. There are also new federal tax credits on the book. Throughout, there's been a focus on costs, even though you're going to say these are real, it's an expensive school. The school has cost conscious choices of materials, long lasting, durable. The three floor design itself is more energy efficient and is, uh, was, is less expensive to build. As I mentioned, the site allows us to keep this current school open. There won't be let disruption in classes. By combining two schools, we're going to lower operating costs and avoid very high repair costs. I'll only mention the number once, but we're, the estimate is about 40 million per school of Wildwood and Fort River, so $80 million. And this is because the roo roofs, the HVAC system, the plumbing, the electricity, uh, safety, um, the basic systems are aging and are at risk of breaking down. We're expecting to get a facility grant $43 million toward this project. So it's new, big resources for the town. And it's a new community resource. We're upgrading the community fields. There'll be nature fails. The community will be able to use the school after hours. And there's a backup generator. Um, I've talked about the site plan a little bit, and I'm just going to where my pointer is pointing. If you can see it, there's a very shadowy line here. That's the existing Fort River School. And we're able to, because the site is so large, 31 acres, we can build the new school a good 100 feet away. And there'll be fences around it. And then one of the, to guard the kids and protect them. And one of the people at a forum said, are the kids going to be able to see? And we said, yeah, we can put some burlap sacks. They can lift up the flaps and take a look at what's going on. So can townspeople. We're, we've, we're seeing a site circulation where the buses come in and out on the southern entrance up on the northern entrance cars will be coming in and out so the buses and cars won't be crossing over each other so it makes for a very efficient way of bringing the kids in and there throughout this these are circles and squares there's community, there's children's gardens, there's play spaces, there's walking spaces, as well as this huge recreation field up north of the building. The building is, you'll see a layout, and I'm going to go to the first floor in a second, but it's north-south. So this is when, when you see my pictures, this is going to be one side is the north side, and one side is the south. And it has design for safe entrance and exit. This is a layout of just the first floor. I'm not going to show you floor two and three. The classrooms are very similar. As I mentioned, there are two grades on each floor, and they face each other along um, a, a corridor. So if you can imagine th the second floor, whoops, excuse me, the second floor has got the second and third graders and the privileged kids, the fourth and fifth graders, get the top floor. This entrance these are secure entrances that you will have to register when you come in um, if you're not one of the kids or the teachers. And this whole space can be shut off if we want to use it for after school activities. The rooms themselves can be shut off for safety. The doors can lock if the teachers want to lock them. So it's been it's both a safety building and it's completely accessible. It'll be fully ADA accessible throughout the building. Now I'm going to take you on the virtual tour. And we've, we've had these very creative architects who have been able to give us a sense of what the building will look like as we get through the massing. This is as, as if you were coming in by car with the front entranceway here. Um, you'll notice it says the Fort River 
elementary school, but we've talked about if this moves forward is we could have a naming contest. It does not have to have that name. As we swing around to the north side, the cafeteria with a stage is located on this floor, and the kids are going to be able to come outside and eat at picnic tables. Up above it is the library, and both of them have big windows so the kids are connected to the out of stores while being indoors. This orange sticking out classroom, the kindergartens have more square footage than the others. And so they're a distinctive look on the building. And all of this building is brick. It's not fancy. The, we pick the least expensive, longest durable materials. As I swirl around, some of these are play spaces and some of them are learning areas. They're designated and they, we, the teachers asked us to separate them. This is gonna be gardens where the kids can have um, be doing growing. And what you can't see is out here are some rain gardens to take rainwater away, but also to be able to have environmental studies. As I swing around to this other side, you're gonna be able to see the gym. I'm just gonna move it a little faster. The gym, there's an entrance when the buses come in, the kids will be able to come in either this door or walk around coming in the front door. This is the gymnasium. And there's a lot of space here if we do do if we do public art and we commission some murals to do it. The school itself will have photovoltaic on its roofs up here and up here and on the parking lot that will generate renewable. Now I'm entering. This is coming through that front entrance way as we swing along. Um, Tammy can talk about her preference. She's her, the principal's office is right up front so she can greet the kids. Um, turning, uh, you're going to see a space. These are just space holders for murals, for artwork. As we swing around, the gymnasium is on the southern side. And one of the things I saw in a school that Donesco built in Lexington is that with this kind of glass and outdoor, the gym was lit without any electric lights on. So that's one of this glass daylight. And this is the cafeteria, which is directly attached to the music rooms so that the musicians can come and practice or perform on the stage as they are um, in classroom. Now I'm swinging to the upstairs area and you're seeing, I um, mean, I may stop it here so Tammy can talk a little bit about these spaces. This, these are project area spaces where the teachers can bring the kids outside the classroom into small groups to work together with their lockers here. And this is all storage, storage area for the students. This is something that is starting to be built in quite a few schools to allow small group and projects um, and have not just sit in a classroom. And this is a classroom view where each teacher is gonna be, have a role in saying exactly where the whiteboards are. There'll be sinks in the classroom. And I'm gonna do a quick pause here so Tammy, can talk a little bit about this space. The, the way that the, each grade level is on one side is a younger grade and another grade with these project areas. So Tammy, do you want to say a few words about what you see as the usefulness of this design? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, just do a brief uh, thank you to everybody for your kind words. It really means a lot. Um, I really do love being principal. Um, it's certainly been a journey, but I really am enjoying it. Uh, when I look at these uh, learning spaces, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, having been at Fort River for, I think I'm on my 20th year, I can really appreciate um, the, the support that the school committee has given and, and Mike in terms of thinking about co-teaching um, and really doing a lot of inclusive work over the last five to seven years. And what this is gonna really do is promote a higher level of collaboration um, and inclusion uh, for all students, right? So when I think about my students that are multilingual learners, when I think about my neurodiverse students, um, there are times when they're pulled out into separate classrooms because of how loud it might be or or, or um, just, you know, things that might sort of drag their attention away from uh, their learning. However, these, these classrooms um, and being able to work in small group right outside the classroom, I think is really going to allow for a greater level of collaboration um, and inclusivity uh, for all of our learners. 
What I also like about the way the school is designed is it also allows for more grade level collaboration between the teachers as well as some uh, vertical and horizontal alignment for the teachers. I think that uh, right now in the way the schools are designed, it doesn't, while it kind of allows for that, it's not always easy. And I think too, because each classroom will have a standard set of what the, the design of the classroom as well as furniture, I think it will lead to less moving around, <laughs> which which can cause a lot of, at least in my years at Fort River, almost every year I moved as a teacher, um, can be really challenging. Um, so I, you know, I think it helps to reduce teacher stress, but also um, in the long run will lead to greater collaboration and definitely um, less transitions and more uh, on, uh, on time learning for students. And this is as we continue the virtual tour, this is the library. And as I mentioned, when I swirled around the outside, this is on the second floor looking out. Again, the emphasis is on bringing daylight in. All of these bookcases are movable. So the teachers can uh, decide, I'm gonna have a teaching area here, a teaching area there. The only ones that aren't are along the wall. Um, so it, it's got a design, it, the design is an emphasis on flexibility. Whoops. Tammy already spoke about the advantages for kids. Um, I'm not going to read off of this, but education was really drove the design. There was a lot of collaboration with staff on uh, what do the classrooms look like? Where are they next to each other? Um, supportive design for the dual language program. There's an emphasis on being able to go outside to learn, not just inside as well as play with spaces designated for it. And it's really an, an up-to-date technology for 21st century learning, including a wiring system with safety. So the other thing I think that's really important um, as I saw a, a video of a school that was a net zero elementary school is that the school itself, this idea of net zero, that it's electric, no fossil fuels, that we're using renewable energy, that it's efficient. It's a learning lab for the kids. There's an opportunity here for our youngest kids to grow up in a school to learn about the climate by participating in it. Um, we're going to be reducing greenhouse gas emissions quite a bit by the shift to this school. And as I mentioned earlier, we expect to about get, get rebates and incentives for geothermal and their new federal tax credits. I'm going to, there's going to be a switch here in voices um, because we're going into the costs of the school. With supply costs going up for virtually all parts of construction, as well as labor costs, the building a school today is expensive. Um, you can see the total budget's about 98 million. I should say that there is underneath the 81 million, but also in the 98, there's an allowance for inflation. There's a lot of contingency money, so that we're we're we have a we have a chance of hitting this target rather than exceeding it. We're we've got an estimated MSBA Massachusetts School Building Authority facility grant of about 43 million to help us pay for it. Um, with, but that leaves a town share of 55 million. And Sean is gonna take over here to describe how we are gonna be funding the town share. Sean? Sure. Thank, thank you, Kathy. Um, so that 98 million that Kathy just mentioned, um, it originally was $5 million higher, but the school building committee um, realizing that we have to do what we can to get the cost of the project down, um, identified $5 million worth of um, reductions that don't affect um, the overall quality of the building or the function of the building, um, but but scaled it back in a way to get it down to that $98 million figure. Um, and so the town share of approximately 55 million, we're continuing to look for ways to reduce that amount, um, but we are proposing a debt exclusion for whatever the town's net share ends up being. So if we do find some other sources that can reduce uh, how much we have to borrow for this project, um, that will reduce the total amount of the debt exclusion. Um, but there will be some amount that um, uh, that will have to go out for borrowing. Um, so uh, a debt exclusion is a temporary increase in the yeah sorry stay on that side. Um, so a debt exclusion is a temporary increase in property taxes um, to pay for the debt of a specific project. Um, it is 
different than an override. You may hear the term override, or you may see that in other communities. Uh, an override is a permanent increase in the levy limit to usually to pay for operating type expenses for the town. Um, but in this case, we're proposing a debt exclusion, uh, which again is temporary. And it's only can only be used to pay for the debt service costs of this school project. Um, so the town council has already set the date for the special election and, and settled on some voting um, parameters. And so that date is set for May 2nd. That will be the, uh, the date of the town-wide vote. And the uh, there's really two votes that have to happen from this point forward. There's the town-wide vote, um, which authorizes the town to exclude the debt. The other vote is to authorize the debt. This is a vote the town council must take. Um, and that is currently scheduled for April 3rd. And that vote requires a two thirds, uh, two -thirds approval of the town council to authorize um, us to go out and, and borrow the funds. Next slide. Um, so you can see at the top here, the $55 million, sort of the share that belongs to the town after the MSBA grant is reduced. Um, there's an estimate for what it would take to um, add a half percent for art. Now that half percent for art would likely not come from the, it, it wouldn't come from the debt exclusion, that would come from some other source. Um, so the number we're really looking at here is the 55 million. Some of the sources that we've started to identify uh, to reduce that $55 million further is the $1.6 million in uh, rebates from Eversource that Kathy spoke about earlier. Um, this is largely related to the geothermal aspect. There's um, very um, uh, beneficial and new incentives related to geothermal that uh, the timing of our project, it works well with those incentives. Uh, the town council has already authorized $700,000 from the Community Preservation Act to support um, part of the field uh, cost of the project. So that 700,000 would also reduce the amount that we would need the debt exclusion for. Um, so those two are, are more firm in terms of savings. And so when we've modeled the impacts of the debt exclusion, we've reduced those two pieces. So the net amount that we're projecting right now that we would have to borrow is about 53 million. But as Kathy said, we are still looking for other ways to reduce that $53 million further. Uh, so one source that is new uh, was created by the Inflation Reduction Act or, are these federal credits. Um, in the past, towns could not get federal credits directly because we don't pay taxes. Uh, so we'd always have to work with third parties to do solar projects and, and other sustainability projects if we wanted to take advantage of the, the tax benefits. Um, but with the new Inflation Reduction Act, the federal government has proposed actually making payments in lieu of tax credits to municipalities. And so it's very new um, and, the, and the detailed regulations aren't out yet, but um, the rough estimates of what the uh, of what the payments could look like for this project are between two and three and a half million. Um, and there's other projects in town that might also be eligible for credit. So this is the, this estimate is just for the school project. And then I'll just say one other on that prior slide. Um, one other thing that the finance committee has recently uh, voted on is a recommendation to use five million dollars of capital stabilization funds. Uh, to further reduce the project or the, the borrowing for the project. Uh, the council has not approved that yet, but it has come out of finance committee as a recommendation and will be considered by the, the town council at one of their upcoming meetings. So uh, the way we get to the impacts of the debt exclusion is we take the amount that we have to, uh, that we project we will need to borrow um, and we model out a, a debt repayment schedule, sort of like a mortgage on a house. We look at the principal payments that we're gonna have to make over the life of the debt, and then what the interest will also be. Um, and so when we did that for this project based on the 53 million, uh, it comes out to $1.07 per $1,000 of assessed value um, of additional taxes that would need to be raised. And so what that means is for an average single, uh, single family home, assessed at 447,000, which was the average in FY23, it would mean an additional tax of $478 for that year. So this is the sort of the peak additional tax. When we uh, project the debt exclusion out, we project it ramping up slowly over a couple of years, reaching a certain point and then staying at that point for the, for the life of the borrowing. Um, so this 478 is that peak. Uh, and we also anticipate that that peak will slowly drop over um, over the life of the debt as the tax base grows and the taxes are spread out over more people um, and more uh, parcels, that impact would slowly drop a little bit each year. 
And so for anybody who wants to uh, calculate this for their own property, you would find your assessed value. Um, you can do it on the town's uh, GIS system. We're also putting a tool on the website shortly that'll be available to anyone who wants to look at their property. Um, you find the assessed value for your property, divide it by a thousand and then multiply by that dollar seven and that will give you the annual impact of the debt exclusion. And I think I'll turn it back to you, Kathy. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, these are dates that you've actually were already past one of them. These are some key dates that we're we're keeping in mind. And the one that we've emphasized more than once is this May 2nd vote where all of you will be voting on this. Um, if that vote says yes, which is a simple majority yes, after the town has councils approve this, we expect construction to start in 2024 and the new school to open in 2026. Um, just these are just the closing it's the same take homes at the beginning um the school was designed with education first we it's the kids our children it's climate action there's a new community resource and we focus throughout on costs we are putting up as much information as we can to make sure if people have questions that aren't that it didn't occur to you tonight, or we didn't answer clearly. We've redesigned our project website, which you have on this, with frequently asked questions with lengthy answers. And I really thank everyone. A lot of people who came to forums asked questions so we could think of what, what design, what kind of answers we could provide. The town staff is working on an information sheet that will go with what Sean just described around the debt exclusion, both to define it so people understand it. Um, and we, we're hoping to get that up soon and the two will link to each other. And as I turn it back over to Pam, she asked me to mention, and I, I think I'll just take this down. I didn't put the date up yet because it's not a solid date. But we are we are looking for opportunities to make sure we can be uh, make sure anyone in the community who wants to learn more or be able to ask questions. So we've got a tentative date for March 26. That's a Sunday afternoon, and I have to work with Mike. But talking about a, a panel similar to what you've seen tonight, um, but it would be in person at the middle school. And we'll make sure we get that information out to everyone that has not been scheduled yet. And Tammy, if you're looking at your scheduling, it turns out that one of the districts wasn't planning on having a full presentation. So that afternoon that we had all penciled in is available. So I'm turning it back to you, Pam, and to and to your district members. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for the presentation, Tammy, for weighing in on the educational benefits of it. And Sean, thanks for your explanation. Um, I think I'm I'm going to ask if folks that are attending, I see Judy, Kirsten, Matt, Sandy, Tracy, and Trudy are the six folks in the audience. If you want to join so we can see your faces and being, be able to ask questions to Kathy, Sean, or any of us about the school, uh, raise your hand and we'll bring you in. And I think Lynn, you're going to help with bringing folks in. And also, uh, Pam, we have both Matt Holloway and Kirsten Hollibut, excuse me if I'm butchering your names, are our next guests as well. Excellent. Good. I didn't know who was expecting to speak. So let's bring everyone in if they want to. Um, Matt and Kirsten. So in the next three to five minutes, do you want to give us an overview of, of your um, your position on all this? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll start. And Kirsten, you can correct me as I veer off course, which I, I'm sure I will. Um, we So Kirsten and I are co-chairs of, um, uh, of, of a ballot initiative committee called Yes for Amherst Schools. Um, and our goal is to help mobilize the vote and, and to get um, to approximately... 2,501 votes is kind of our target number in terms of, of getting a yes for this for this uh, debt, ex debt exclusion um, authorization. And um, we're both parents. I'm, I'm a parent of two very young kids. So I am sort of your core demographic, uh, Tamara. Like this is, you know, this is really near and dear to my heart. Um, 
But, you know, for us, it's really we focused on um, kids, climate and cost as being the, the three you know, major benefits of this school. Um, kids obviously need to be served in a in a modern 21st century building. That's you know, there's no question about that. Um, this is a real leader uh, climate wise for for us as a town and and really for a state and, and a nation. And, you know, we had Ellen Story kick off our first event, who is a um, longtime supporter of education in Amherst. And first thing she said was, you know, hey, we need the school for the bragging rights. You know, we, we want to be the net zero school uh, in the valley and and really kind of be a um, and and frankly, you know, we're, we're facing a real obviously climate um, climate cliff here. And so we, we really do need this. We need to take action. Um, and then the cost thing, you know, I mean, Sean and, and Kathy covered it in much greater detail, but, you know, the bottom line is that that saving a quarter million every year on utilities alone is a really significant boon to the um, the operating budget of our schools. And there's a lot of attention on those operating budgets right now. We feel like this is, even though it's it's a little bit counterintuitive, you know, this is a way to pump some money back into the operating budgets for our schools. And, and that's really important, too. Um, so that's uh, real quick. Uh, we have a um, a website, and you can take a pledge if you feel like you're going to take a pledge. Yes, for the schools, uh, or and and that's simply just to help us sort of track our progress towards 2501 votes in town. Um, but there's also an opportunity if you want to be more involved in terms of um, canvassing, and and you know we have many ways that people can pitch in and help out. And that website is yesforamherstschools.org. That's yes for Amherst schools.org. Um, you can take the pledge on there and find much more information on there. Thanks. I'll go look up the website. Uh, Kristen, you want to add something to that? I think Matt did a fine job. Um, I'm not so sure I have much more to add. So yeah, I'm Kirsten Hollibert. I am the co-chair with Matt, as he mentioned. And um, Tammy, my kids just left Port River. I have Hattie Hollibert and Sam LeBlond. So um, yes, have, I'm a parent here in Fort River and have been very involved in, the, in this project for many years. So really, really excited to see it kick off. And I love, I love giving this after we get to see Kathy's presentation because it's just so incredibly inspiring to, uh, to see what we could have. And so um, it's just really exciting and you know, we got a lot of work to do between now and May 2nd, but, um, you know, feeling optimistic and yeah, hope everybody can pitch in that that feels so, um, you know, moved to do that. Great. Thank you so much. And um, thank you all. We'll make sure to share your information. Uh, and it goes without saying, Kathy, thank you. Yeah. So we still have a couple people in the audience. If you want to join in and, and have your faces shown, that would be lovely. Um, and in the meantime, though, I think we have Lynn talking a little bit about budget and where we stand, what the status is, and sort of where we are in the budget cycle. Paul Bachelman, the town manager, is also available to um, address that and answer questions. Uh, Pam, can I just ask if, if anyone in your um, group including you and Anika have questions. Um, Cause what, one of the things I think I oh, would yeah. do, uh, we both Tammy and I could exit at that point, um, you know, sure. but I make sure we, we don't leave if there are any questions. Um, and I will make sure that the, just the chart pack with the video, um, all of this is going to be made available in some way that what you just saw, but, um, but I just, particularly let, letting Tammy leave if um be but if there are questions we want to answer them thank you thanks for reminding me yes any any questions for the school committee I had a question so maybe I'll ask mine and that will prompt others so on the on the ground floor um, it looked like some of the classrooms which are on the uh the right hand side of the picture uh, some of the larger classrooms had exit doors to the outdoors, and then there were several smaller classrooms next to it, which didn't appear to have exit doors to the outside. And I just wondered if that was expected. I think it was about the time when you said they, the teachers can lock doors. Um, I started looking at the array of doors on that ground floor. So if somebody could explain 
why some of them seem to have it and some of them didn't. That would be helpful. So right now, I'll just jump in. Right now, the design has the kindergartens having, the kindergarten rooms have a door to the outside. None of the other classrooms okay. do. There's a secure entrance. And there is some discussion of whether that's a good idea or not, um, both for security reasons, um, but, um, and, and just for flow. So we have it on a list as a maybe we don't want to have that. We're not required to have it. So it's a, it's a question of that's a choice. So otherwise there's a entrance at the very front of the building. There's one by the gym, both going out side there's you can leave the cafeteria and go outside and you can leave at the far end by the classrooms and go outside so that we're trying to limit the amount that people can come in from anywhere or can leave from anywhere so you know tammy we we had that discussion and we didn't actually completely resolve it because there are uh, there's the issue of whether the kindergarten we're not required to have a door at going out of the kindergarten. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Kathy and or Tammy? I don't see any. I don't see any. So thank you really for spending another evening on the subject. Thank you. Thank you for having us and putting it on. Um, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Sean, you're free to go as well, I think, if uh, unless you want to answer budget questions. <laughs> I'm here. I guess I'll, I'll stay for a little bit longer, see if there's any Great. budget questions. Great. Thank you. Lynn, turn it over to you. So I want to talk about the preparation for FY24, and I also want to talk about our capital expenditures. So with regard to FY24, we actually begin the budget process going early in the fall. Uh, Sean puts together a financial indicators presentation. We usually have that during the first week or so of November. And we hold a forum where we listen to what people in the public would like to see in the budget. Um, and then the Finance Committee issues, a, and by the way, Matt Holloway is a member of the Finance Committee. So... Uh, yeah. We're heavily represented by finance tonight. Um, and the finance committee then brings to the town council a set of proposed guidelines, financial guidelines, and the town council then passes those usually in December. Uh, if we have to, we can revisit them, but most importantly, they have to also be tied to the town manager's goals because we can't give the town manager goals money to do those goals. And that's an ongoing question with us. The um, In this year's budget, there just isn't wiggle room. And that's a really tough thing. Last year, we made a commitment uh, to begin our new CREST program and to also fund four additional firefighters. And that alone is a lot of commitment to maintain, we will maintain that, or at least I have every expectation. The town manager will present us with his budget on May 1st. The finance committee will then begin a thorough and complete discussion of that budget during the month of May. We usually meet twice a week, and um, we're talking about whether some of those meetings might be in the evening and some during the daytime. Uh, and then sometime, before the end of um, June, we have to pass a budget. So we have a budget to run the town with. That's the operating budget. And the only thing that's a little awkward or if you will, out of cycle with that is that we have to do the regional school budget earlier than that. And the reason we have to do that is because of the regional schools having four towns, the four towns, the other three towns, if you will, have town meetings. And so we need to act in accordance with their kind of timeline as well. In addition to that, as we look at this capital project, I keep hearing a couple themes. And so I just wanna use the opportunity to address those. Some people suggest, well, let's not do the library because then we could put that money toward the school. Well, I have very unfortunate news for you. The town is only putting in about 15 million 
into the library. And if we don't do the rest of the project and take the money from the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, as well as the fundraising money, we're going to be spending most of that 15 million, if not all of it, on just repairing the existing library. So in reality, that money's not available for the school. Then I've also heard recently, oh, well, I'm not going to vote for the school because I haven't gotten my fire station. Well, the problem is, if you don't vote for the school, you won't get your fire station. And the reason you won't get your fire station is because we will be spending all of our capital money on trying to keep two very, very energy hog buildings going that are in need of major repair and with estimates in the millions, in the tens of millions of dollars. And so the plan that we are working on, which is a plan that has been in evolution over the last four or five years, is really the opportunity to try to move forward with each of these buildings and bring to Amherst what we have needed to do for a long time, including get our other buildings in good repair, as well as embrace sustainability. So I really, that's my pitch for voting for the elementary school. It's fiscally very sound and it is educationally clearly quite sound. So that's my fiscal speech for tonight. There you go, questions? <laughs> and you have the other two experts here. I mean, I don't know why I'm doing the fiscal tonight, but there you go. Because we asked you first. Thank you. We have we have three participants in the audience and you're again welcome to just raise your hand and come on into the meeting so we can see you and share the, the conversation with you. Um, and if any of the three of you have questions specifically on the budget or the budget cycle, please raise your hand and ask. Not hearing any specific questions. Paul or Sean, do you want to add anything to that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I on the school project in particular, I think this is a really important and unique opportunity. For years, we have had a plan for how to address these four major capital projects. Um, this, um, we still have our plan. It's still within the limits of Proposition Two and a Half, with the understanding that the school would have to be excluded from the debt. We can't do the all four projects. And that's always been the case from day one when we started thinking about this um, many years ago. We've had to adjust some things because of the increase in costs and the increase of borrowing costs, but we're still on track to be able to, to work on all four of these things. It might take a little bit longer than we initially anticipated, but we understand the priorities of the town in terms of education, fire, and uh, library and, and DPW. These are four buildings that need investment one way or the other. And that's what's going to be a focus for the town in terms of our capital. We've done a really good job as a community in, in building up our reserves to be able to help pay for some of these buildings as we move forward. That's been really important for two reasons. One is, so we have money to set aside to help support the buildings, but also so our bonding agency sees that we have adequate reserves in case something goes south. That's really an important factor in what our bond rating is. The bond rating is important because the, the better bond rating you have, the lower interest costs you pay for borrowed money. And that's real money over time. And that's really important to us. So unique opportunity for us um, to move forward. We're you know, working really hard, Sean and um, Sonia Aldridge and the entire finance team have done a tremendous job of managing the budget so that we're always within, um, within our budget and uh, returning uh, funds back to the town every year. Um, it's a tough year though. We, all, we acknowledge that it's gonna be a tough year, but um, this is a project that can't be delayed any further. I had a question from somebody um, uh, earlier this week. And the question was about Centennial water plant or treatment plant. And the question is, why is that not being considered uh, a typical capital project? Why is that not number five? It, well, it's the funding source for the Centennial plant is from the Water and Sewer Fund. 
So it's not from the general, it's not going on the general taxpayers rolls that will be built into the tax, the, the uh, water, the water rates. Um, and so that's how that project gets, gets paid for. Yeah, just to add to that. So the town operates a number of enterprise funds, which are legal um, sort of instruments to track different activities the town engages in. And so the four that we operate are the water fund, the sewer fund, um, our solid waste fund, which is primarily the transfer station, and our transportation fund, which is parking uh, primarily in downtown. Um, and so when you set up these funds, they're supposed to be self-sustaining, whatever that operation is, is supposed to be completely self-sustained by the, uh, the fees that that activity charges. Um, so in the case of Centennial, it's, it is a source for our water supply. And so the water rates are supposed to support all the costs associated with, with um, providing water to the community. Um, and so the, as you mentioned, the costs have, have gone up there, but I think the thing I'll just put out, um, remind everyone is that we were able to get the, the state to kick in a, a greater share for that project as well. It's um, not only the uh, forgiveness that they're gonna give the town in terms of uh, sort of a direct contribution, um, but the other big thing with that project is that they finance a large share of it and the rate that they finance is well below market rates right now. Market rates have obviously gone up quite a bit in the last year or so um, and they will they'll help finance the project. So um, that's that's really the main reason why that project is funded through water rates as opposed to the our regular capital. Thank you. That's essentially what I told them, but I wanted to hear it from, from the expert. Um, in our audience, in our small, very small audience, are there any questions on this topic at all before we move to the next one, which is a conversation about the roads and sidewalks that we're, that we're addressing this coming year? We've got Judy, Tracy, and Trudy. And again, you're welcome to just raise your hand and come on into the conversation so we can see you if you'd like. Anika. Well, I just wanted to add because we were talking about water. So I have a little bit of wonky reception. So I had to find another area. So um, I just wanted to share that I am joined by District 4 residents, Rod Anderson and Lily Wajik from um, Elitech, who are, we're so lucky to have amongst us. They're doing amazing things with uh, water. And um, I hope that you all, if you have it, I know most of you are aware um, to look at their company, Elitech. So I just wanted to share that we do have some other District 4 residents with us here. Thanks. Um, can you explain where they are? Because I don't see the the <laughs> are they with you personally like next sitting next to you they're across from me yes. great did they have any questions not as of yet but they're um you know really uh, interested in some of the items upcoming especially what paul was here to speak to us about great Good. sidewalks excellent so let's transition to that topic. Um, there is always great interest in streets and sidewalks this time of year as we bump our way through town. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit of that um, and see some I wanted um, to thank Paul for joining us, especially at such short notice. Um, he's going to paraphrase as, as best he can. Um, within the time he has a, a wonderful we had a fascinating presentation that came to TSO that I learned so much about and we're going to be sharing that with everyone as well so with that thank you Paul thanks Anika um so if it's okay I'm going to I'm not going to show show the whole presentation but I want to race through it just so people see what so they can when they click on it um so if that's okay with you guys mm -hmm. okay and before, just saying, before you start, I see Tracy's hand up, and I think that maybe yep. means that she wants to come in, Lynn. You should come in, yeah. And Judy and Trudy are also welcome to just come in so we can see your faces if you'd like. You don't have to, but you're welcome to join us. Ooh. 
So are we seeing the pavement plan? Okay. Um, so so I, we made this presentation last year, but I just want to let people know this is available on the website and we can share it out to the counselors and they can share it out to their listeners as well. So every few years we do a um, survey of all the town's roads that DPW does, and we, they develop a list of roads that need to be um, repaved or treated. So I'm gonna run through this. They actually do, they drive every road in town with this little 3D camera outfit. Uh, it's called Speed Scan. And this is a group out of Northeastern University that start, got started at Northeastern University. And they, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but uh, DPW, the town engineer has in the past, they they look at all the different ways a, a, a street is, is wearing and they can cat categorize it. And ultimately after looking at the road, they give it a grade, a PCI range of um, from zero, which is, means it, it's undrivable to um, excellent. We don't have many excellence. Um, so excellent is just like what you would expect an excellent to be, it's a beautiful roads. Freshly paved looks great. Um, good condition means that it's got some cracking, but it's still, you, you won't notice it. Um, we move to very poor, um, you know, poor, very poor. And you can see it, the worse it gets, you know, the, the lower the grade. Um, when we did this um, for the town of Amherst in 2022, uh, this uh, these were the roads that were and how they're color coded if you can see the colors um, and what conditions they were in. And then they also identify various uh, way where the roads are the most distressed. Um, this is an example of how every road is graded. You, it has the, the street name, it has the, the proximity from Amity Street to University Le Drive um, to Northampton Road and the PCI rating of it. So that's how they, they do every road in town. And every road gets a PCI grade. Um, when we looked at this last year, we showed a $49 million backlog of road repairs that needed to be done. Now, to put that in perspective, we put almost $2 million a year into roads every year. Um, about $850,000 comes from the state. The rest has been appropriated by the town council to address roads. Even though it's, it's, it's twice as much as what, what we have been doing in the past, and we've put a lot of money in over the past five years, it's not nearly enough to meet the, the need. Um, and to put it in perspective, 2018, when we did this last time, the backlog was $27 million. So we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, um, when they look at a road and they determine what needs to be done, they, they, it can be from a full reconstruction to just sort of a crack ceiling, which is when oftentimes a crack ceiling is where they put the sort of uh, the black sort of stuff on the um, road that covers up the crack so water doesn't get in and it makes the roads last longer. So there's different treatments to the roads depending on um, what the condition of the road is. And they will, um, not every road needs to be totally repaired and resurfaced. And they, and they try to extend the life of the roads as best they can. Um, so this is an example of the kind of repair construction, like they'll say crack seal or, or surface treat, and then they put an estimated cost on it. And this is just an example. And every road gets some kind of assessment this way and whether it needs work or not. So these, these are the repair table. This is sort of hard to see, but this is the outlines of the town of Amherst, which looks like a number one. Um, so in spring of 2022, we have a list of all the worst roads um, and what the cost was. Um, this, in this presentation, it lists all the roads that were resurfaced in the last six years and what the cost was um, in different categories. Um, so we have, uh, these are all the things that were put that we have for 2022 and 2023, and it includes some sidewalk work. Um, the, I'm gonna just point out one. So this, these are the roads that we had on the list for this year. We didn't get to all of them because the contractors had, it's really hard to get contractors right now. But we, if you look at the first one, which is Bay Road from Hulst Road to the Belchertown line, it was rated as a 46. It needed a full reclamation. Um, the cost for that one stretch of road, uh, which was 4,000 feet, um, 
less than a mile was $853,000. And that was pretty much the entire chapter 90 allocation from the state. That's the state, those are the state funds that we get as a town. Um, our needs are way more than what the state is giving us. And that's something we'll be testifying at the um, state and Senate Ways and Means hearing on Monday to let them know that. Um, these are the crack ceiling work that was uh, scheduled to be done. Um, these were the sidewalks that were scheduled to be done. I think almost all of them are completed or close to being completed. We also get money in from different grants from the community development block grant, which is money that the town has where we did Mill Lane um, from West Street to the Groff Park entrance. And we'll be doing Kellogg Avenue from North Pleasant Street to the bend in the road. Um, that will happen next year, well, this year, actually. We also get some Mass Works grant funded project. We have a one, we were able to uh, obtain a $1.5 billion grant from Mass Works for the uh, West for Pomeroy West Street intersection. Um, these are the so we have a list of the roads that we want to be able to do in 2023. Um, they're finalizing the bid documents now to put this out there. Um, this is a preventive maintenance work. So this is about $1.5 million worth of roads for the rehab and reconstruction. That's where you see the big equipment really like sort of re, what you think of as repaving. Um, preventive maintenance is the crack seal and that's about a hundred thousand um, dollar contract that we're estimating. Um, and that's sort of what the presentation is. So I think um, really what we wanna do is just have a conversation and um, about what your concerns are, what you're hearing, and we can sort of just talk it through. But I want to let people know that this, there's a science to how the, the town reviews roads. Um, it's, it's based in data. And then once we have this sort of uh, review, things change during the course of the year. One road might just blow up suddenly. And that's what happened with Bay Road a year ago. And it's just like, wow, that one's gonna zoom to the top because it's in such bad shape. You know, we're looking at Heatherstone, for instance, right now, that's, that road has really uh, fallen apart. And that's something that we're looking at pretty seriously as well. I don't know, Tracy, what do you, what do you have to say? <laughs> Tracy, uh, well, I did. Um, I haven't seen. I mean, I had seen the presentation last year when, after um, the inventory was on the PCI, but I hadn't seen the list of the projects. So mm -hmm. I would like to. And so, where is that available? Is it? Did it go to TSO? No, or yeah, it was. It was in the original presentation. Um, oh, okay, it was. Well, right. I can send it to you. I'll send it to you right now. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, I have a tag meeting tomorrow and I did ask Guilford if he could speak to it briefly because, um, because I had seen that it was on the agenda here and I said, district four is talking about it. Tax should talk about it too. Uh, I, I, I do have some questions just about with, uh, JCPC, how they, they were taking resident requests for road improvements and just, um, I have questions about that process, but also, you know, given the budget constraints, like do people understand, you know, the the constraints themselves, those financial constraints themselves could determine whether or not things are getting funded and how, like how that whole process works. I don't know. So it seems like it seems like there could be some confusion about it. Because I know people, I guess they were allowed to submit requests up to $50,000 in some conversations I had heard. People said, well, we have $50,000. So, mm -hmm. and then, you know, if each person submits and they think they have $50,000. Um, really but point. also given the constraints, like are any of them gonna be funded? And, and the one thing that had come up too at the JCPC meetings, which I've thought a lot about is just with the resident requests at least, is that, you know, for example, like the North Amherst neighborhood came in and they had a number of requests for improvements for, um, you know, speed humps and um, and a crosswalk and things like that. But I know that, and they were concerned about cut through traffic that speeds. And I know that there are other neighborhoods that have some of the same concerns. Um, some of them have asked TAC about them or I've heard about them at different times and, um, and so, and none of those other neighborhoods also submitted requests. So maybe people don't understand, you know, how to do it or things. And is it just, and I think, and even the JCPC members were having conversations about, 
you know, if you like who hears the call to submit requests and who responds to it. And I mean, there's a lot of other neighborhoods that could have concerns too, and how important it is to have a comprehensive approach. Um, and I suggested that actually to Kathy Shane, just that um, because I knew that there were other neighborhoods too, so not just look at this one neighborhood and say, we're gonna do everything we can for, because they were the ones who showed up, but also yeah. think about the others too. Yeah, I and think, I mean, that's one of the things that TAC thinks about a lot, just to be yeah. comprehensive. I, th I think so. that's a really good point. I think Sean may want to weigh on it. Initially, the capital request form was to provide an opportunity for residents to submit projects that they thought should be uh, attended to by the town. It was not really anticipated to be a road request project. Someone did submit it that way, and then so, uh, the word got out and said, "Hey, we can," and, and we didn't we didn't disqualify any projects. Um, it was really intended to be other sort of smaller capital projects that people thought like uh, we need we want to put a playground in or we want a piece of equipment somewhere or something like that. Sean, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, uh, um, Trace, I think we tend to agree with you on the safety improvements in particular that that's really needs more of a comprehensive approach to the town as opposed to one off speed humps here and there. So, um, you know, it's walking the fine line of we want to, you know, people took time to submit these requests and so we want to honor that and at the same time realize we can't just do one part of town and have this you know this safety program for this one particular part of town but not the rest of town so no so right we're, sure so right. we're gonna to have to um you know it'll be i think when working with jcpc um we'll have to think about what type of recommendation they make related to those because i think we had eight requests and i think six of the eight were some type of safety improvement um so ultimately we'll see what jcpc recommends but i, I think we agree with you that it's sort of a comprehensive approach is um that's what we need to go with i, I would and, second that as well i wondered if if uh tac the um transportation advisory committee actually has a list a growing list of um safety issues things that you've been made aware of or anyone in town i don't know if dpw keeps a list of of safety issues that that come across um well i think i mean this is come up a number of times that there's different ways that people report concerns and that um to my information there is no comprehensive list well i think dpw keeps somewhat of a list and sometimes during our meetings guilford will pull it up but there used to be a submission form through tac and we would get some requests that way but it was actually like on paper and i'm sure that the town manager gets requests Sometimes some counselors get requests, um, DPW gets requests and they have C-click fix. And, and I've wondered sometimes like, is there any kind of, you know, central clearinghouse for some of those? I'm um, just so that we could see like all the lists together. Um, and so I don't know if one. <laughs> um, Sounds like and, um, a comprehensive list. Yeah, there's, I don't think uh -huh. there is one. I think everything gets shut down to uh, DPW, but you know, I think they're also working from this PCI index in their own sort of eyeballing things. Um, so, but that's, yeah. I think it's a really good point, Tracy. Well, and I think too, I mean, so, you know, recently with the snow, it came up about um, sidewalks and I'm sure, um, Paul, that you had heard from some people about their sidewalks not being cleared. And um, so this is getting away from some of the capital projects, but, and, and maintenance projects, but, um it is still really hard currently like i'm really glad that gol was taking a look at the snow and ice bylaw yeah. um, which is something i had requested they to do but just because it's really I, I mean i know as somebody who walks a lot like i have been frustrated that i i don't know how to actually get a response <laughs> and that like last year i did put it in c click fix and, you know, I got a response from DPW said, oh, not our, you know, that's not our thing. Like, you need to contact the police. They're the ones who enforce. And so, you know, case closed. And so then I kind of struggled to find somebody who to contact at the police department. I contacted just the general email. Um, and so this year, you know, there were a few sidewalks um, where a few stretches of sidewalks, including some commercial stretches, um, for example, along University Drive where from um, Amity all the way to Route 9 on the west side of the street, it was completely unshoveled 
for days, um, the big wide plaza and everyone else. And the only people who did shovel, and I really appreciate it, was pleasantries. Um, but not, nobody else did. And actually, some of the plows on the private ro road there, they actually shoveled huge, huge piles of snow into the sidewalk mm -hmm. and into the curb cuts and things like that. Um, and so I did call the police dispatch line, as I've been told to do. And when I called, I'm not sure they, I'm not sure what happened after that, but they said, well, you really need to contact DPW. <laughs> so I was just, <laughs> you know, I still, I still really do wonder, like, do, do tickets ever actually get issued for snow and ice? And, and what do we do, you know, when I, like, I would love it if it was in C-Click Fix or something. Just because, you know, I called and then I waited a few days and I still think that they haven't really shoveled that and some of it's melted, but what what's my recourse when nothing happens? And yeah, so the current bylaw allow the enforcement agent is the police department. I right. don't think they really prioritize that, you know. No, it, of course not. Yeah. Um, I didn't call some, them on Saturday or Sunday, but <laughs> but it, it but, uh, ultimately I, ultimately I took yeah, pictures. But, yeah, go ahead. And it's not yeah. DPW's responsibility to clear the no. ways that are in front of people's houses. I mean, they they do make the effort right. of making one through on certain sidewalks based on mm -hmm. uh, historical sort of walking paths and things like that. Uh, and that's way, I'll tell you this, from my personal experience, that's way more than any other town does. And, you know, we do, <laughs> they go way out and, and mostly for prime walking paths, so kudos to them. But they want to always communicate that they make one pass at it, they're not you know, it's really up to the property owners, the abutting property owners to clear the path. In terms of enforcement, I think that's what one of the things that GOL and the council is looking at is who should be enforcing and how and right. who has the authority to enforce. Um, I think pretty much people recognize the police are not exactly the ones. Um, and sometimes it's it takes some discretion, you know, because it might be someone who's elderly who doesn't have the funds or the wherewithal right. to be able to clean their path. So we want to be able to be sensitive to it. We can't, don't want to just start putting out tickets. Clearing snow but, off the sidewalks is a, is a thing in so many communities and it's really uh -huh. hard to manage because when there's a big snowstorm, you have 24 hours, you're supposed to clear it. Um, and there's so many places that don't. It's like like catching someone speeding on the highway. Everybody's speeding and it's just a matter of catching somebody. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so one thing I found is that so what um, DPW has said in the past is that if there is like a snow or ice event that's pretty minor and they don't plow then the streets, then they don't do the sidewalks either. And so I do think that of our various storms in the last few weeks, like we did have that day that was basically just a bunch of ice, you know, it was like an inch or two of ice and um, they didn't go out that day. And so, there are some sidewalks that I walk on frequently where I think the town typically does do the sidewalks and they didn't do it in that case. And so this whole stretch of sidewalk was not done at all. Um, and then they did do it in the last storm, the storm over the weekend, because because they were out plowing the street. So then they did the sidewalk. But at that point, that stretch of sidewalk had been impassable for a number of days and also the layer of ice on the bottom didn't always come up when the plow came through. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, so, I mean, I almost feel like, you know, if the town, and it, we're at the, almost at the end of the season, of course, but if the town could do some major outreach and maybe not just through like the typical town channels in terms of like people who already are on, you know, see the town's tweets and see the Facebook page or get the emails and things, because I'm not even sure that every, all the owners realize like what their responsibilities are. Right. Um, and I actually talked just today, actually, to somebody who's lived in their home downtown and there's a sidewalk outside their home um, since like the 1980s. And they said, yeah. well, you know, the town does, the town plows the sidewalk on Lincoln and they plow this other sidewalk and they don't come in front of my house, but we don't shovel, we don't think it's that important or, you know, whatever. So I think that just really to, it almost makes me want to go when I, you know, after I talk to the police and I just know they're so busy with so many other things, but go, almost go, you know, put flyers or do some kind of mailing or just get the word out really broadly in the community that it is important. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think yeah. you bring it. It's, it's an interesting idea. We could actually potentially put something in the tax bills, that, which goes right. every property yeah. owner in the like the December bill that says, especially if we pass a new bylaw to alert people that there sure. is a new bylaw. Um, be aware that you are responsible and you may not know this already, but you are responsible for this or something like that. The other point I want to make is that the DPW generally doesn't treat sidewalks. We don't, they don't put salt down or anything like that. And so like for uh, that day when it was really icy, they did, they may have treated the streets with just salt, but they did, there was nothing to plow. Speak right, so, sure. And, but they wouldn't do that on the sidewalks. I mean, that would be a fury if they tried to do that on the sidewalks. Paul, I will say we generally like to send out positive information with the tax bills <laughs> uh, instead of adding you, more. You get, to, you, you get to shovel your sidewalk. How about that? Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we should think about that. But <laughs> Part of our wellness program. Yeah. I want to I want to go back to the conversation that, that Tracy actually started about, you know, sort of the who to call. Um, if, if, in the JCPC, we are talking about um, not just a, a sort of a, actually not JCPC, but in, in thinking about roads for the upcoming year, we have the pavement condition index. If perhaps there was yet another category, which is sort of the safety concerns, the speeding, the, the whatever other safety concerns, crosswalks, that kind of thing. Um, it may be that that ultimately that um, the selection of roads to be worked on is a combination of those two, but it's made clear that that there may be, in fact, some, it's not just the, the condition of the pavement, it's also maybe other factors. And I'm sure, I'm sure that is discussed, but perhaps it could just be made a little clearer to people who say, well, why didn't you do my road? Well, because you know, there were five others that were really bad. Or yeah. very unsafe condition. So it might be something that it's kind of an and and. A um, couple other questions just from a from a town staffing standpoint. We have a lot of the, I don't know exactly the total dollar amount that is made available both from our budgets, but also from all the state and other uh, sources. Does that cover any of our staff, or is that strictly for contracts? Work. Almost all of it. Almost all of it is contract. Okay. And or material. Or, or material. If if our staff are doing something, they'll take material out of that. And do we know sort of the equivalent of how many how many full time people actually spend time from town staff on road work, road repair, road maintenance kind of stuff? So we have the highway department, uh, which is really, but they serve our is our catch-all department. They do, they will also move election equipment on election day. They do all kinds of things. Um, they'll help out on major water breaks, things like that. Um, you know, they're the ones who are doing the potholes and things. And um, but they we've gotten them out of they, they were actually paving sidewalks and roads and things like that. And I think we sort of moved them out of that because I think. Professional companies who do that are what a lot more efficient in terms of how they they can mobilize. The challenge we have for a lot of that is that there are only three paving companies in Western Massachusetts, and as more we're all a lot of cities and towns are experiencing it. And when the state comes in, they have a lot more money now. They trump everybody because they pay a lot more than everybody. So when they say we want to pave something, they all go to them. I just want to make one other comment. The two biggest complaints that we have on roads is that the roads are in terrible condition. I have to crawl through the roads because they're so uh, in such terrible. I have I have to go at five miles an hour. And the second most frequent is people are driving way too fast. The roads are nice and smooth, and they're just cruising through. Which is it used to be in Bay Road, we were getting complaints that like it was taking me forever to get through there. And now we get complaints that their people are speeding. So there's sort of never, and that's always a huge challenge because. Now people want us to do something about Bay Road because people are, they can't stand in their they can't pull out of their driveway because people are going what they feel they can drive as a speed limit. And that's not to I don't want to be make that make light of that because those are very real concerns um, for everybody, you know. So we keep everything kind of at that nebulous middle ground where it's a little rough but not too bad. <laughs> Anika, did you or your friends have any questions on this topic?
Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I was having a little, my reception is wonky even here. Um, yeah. So speaking of safety and walkability, uh, we will have our next neighborhood walk. It's scheduled for Wednesday, March 22nd at 6.30 p.m. And we will focus on the Lincoln Farron McClellan loop. So again, that's Wednesday, March 22nd, 6.30 p.m. We will meet at uh, Kendrick Park by the corner closest to the Rotary. For those of you who joined us before, that was where the, the tree that was lit up is. I don't think that it is lit up any longer, um, but, but right there. So yeah, we have, um, so we'll have, I'm sure, some more sidewalks to look at and we will be focusing on, uh, you know, safety. You know, there's so many reasons where the downtown neighborhood, um, you know, lots of us walk um, and, uh, you know, we have even more reasons. We, we've just had an announcement today that there is a new casual uh, burger restaurant that's opening up in the spring. So we'll have even you know more reasons to be walking downtown and uh, support. So again, March 22nd, 6.30 p.m. at Kendra. Let's walk down McClellan Street. We're proud of that one. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> nice. Yeah. 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 Well, so it's yeah. interesting too. So that that's the week that um, there's spring break, you know? Right. Or is that after spring break? Yeah. Yeah. So could be kind of quiet. <laughs> but. Quiet. You're right. Well, it's not UMass spring break. It is it is Amherst, what, elementary school spring break? No, no, those they had their break in February. So it's UMass, UMass uh last day of classes is the eleventh or tenth. Oh, so it's not it's after spring break then. Yeah. yeah. After spring break. Yeah. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah. I, need to, I need to reach out to Judy and Trudy mm -hmm. as the yeah. as the two attendees to make sure that if you have any questions with this array of experience that's available to you tonight, do you have any questions for the town manager, the town finance director, the president of the council, and your two oh and the TAC chair? And your two counselors, do you have any questions? Judy and Trudy. Seeing oh. that the any so of you I, so yeah, I have a question just about sure. um, budget. And so um, at the last TAC meeting, and we're continuing the discussion tomorrow night, is uh, we were talking about the streetlights proposal. You know, including the idea of having better, smarter lighting fixtures, um, and including the technology or the capability to, in the future, like have smart lights that you can um, control remotely, and you know, set timers and all these different features. So, the thing that came up one one TAC member asked just about the costs of all of that and. Gilford said that with the smart lights like that, you almost you need to have a monthly subscription almost that you would need to log in like to each light <laughs> and um, and then you can control it and everything. Um, so we we're just curious about the total costs and I hadn't seen um, anything on that yet. And I'm sure Gilford is putting together those estimates. Um, but just in terms of, and also too, in terms of how those costs compare to like the other type of maintenance costs and things in terms of the different options for the town. Um, yeah, so that's a council proposal. Um, and, you know, they, I think they're developing the costs of it. Um, and it, it, it seems like everything that we're getting into is a subscription model. It's, it's all software as a service. And every department is facing something where yeah. I'd like to do this, and it's, and it's an ongoing cost. It's our, one of our biggest budget challenges this year. Actually, we're trying to budget for it, but you know, as more and more things, you know, come online, and people want to have the service, and it's great to have. Um, but all these what they what they all these SaaS things, software as a service, right. yeah, sure, are just ridiculous. Um, in terms of the actual costs, I think the idea from the counselors is that. 
we want to, they wanted to have a plan that they would implement over time. So it wouldn't be like a, an initial upfront cost, but as you are replacing lights, you would replace them with the newer technology. Mm -hmm. And you would eliminate a lot of lights. That's the intent of the proposal is to eliminate a lot of lights and perhaps save money in the process. We heard a lot about eliminating lights and this district did not like that idea. Primarily the in-town, you know, people said, well, we're supposed to be walking these streets. How do we do that if we don't have lighting? So that was- that And was, we get requests oh, for new, you know, have, requests for new lights all the time, I'm sorry. Judy would like to come into the room and ask a question. Oh, uh, we got her attention now. <laughs> Only we I get can... requests for new lights all the time too. You know, I, can't see... my house. I can't seem to uh, get her to come in. I'll, I can hit allow to talk. Ah, there she is. Okay. Judy, you need to unmute. There you go. No, you need to unmute again. Let me see if I have to ask. I have my control now. Now my control. I can yeah. I there can you go. Me. Thank you. The, the group that Tracy keeps referring to, Ted, I, I don't know what that is. It's a Ted. transportation advisory committee. Oh, okay. All right. I hadn't, she kept talking about it like this. Well, that's all I had to ask. <laughs> They're very informative. I, there's a lot of things that I did not know. I'm not that here in town that long, um, so I'm learning, you know, listening and learning. What what made you uh, log on today? How did you learn about this? Um, Tr Trudy, actually, who's also on there, sent me a link. And I said, OK, I'm always interested in hearing what's going on. Uh, so I logged in. And I it, it's been very interesting, mostly. But uh, yeah, I don't really have a lot of questions yet, because I don't know a lot to ask about. Can I ask you a question? How do you get your information about the town, typically? Uh, I read the Gazette, uh, which is pretty thorough. When I get that other one, too, the reminder, mm -hmm. that, that always has things and, and tells you all those things that are going yeah. on. Good. And are you on any listservs, like the counselors have listservs and things like that? No. I okay. don't know anything about those. Things. So, Paul, no. might be a good time to plug that there's, um, you can actually subscribe for updates from the town's website as well, where um, you know, you can get information updates directly from the town um, on things going on, events scheduled and so on. Yeah, if you really want to get into it. If you want to get di direct from the source, you know, no, no opinion <laughs> added. Just... Well, and I was thinking about that too with the recent snow emergency. Like I noticed um, when I was walking along North Pleasant Street, west of Kendrick, uh, right after the snow, that there had been this snow emergency and a lot of the student vehicles that are parked, the tenant vehicles that are parked there had all been ticketed. So may, I mean, I'm assuming that, you know, again, I think that just some property owners are not signing up for the listservs or, but in the case of um, the student, I mean, the, these tenants is that if they, perhaps like when they get their parking permits or something, they could be, you know, encourage or advise to like sign up for like the text alerts. I don't know. Did you send out or when does the town send out text alerts? I don't, I used to get them, but I haven't gotten them lately. You, you have to, you can, you can only opt in. You go to notify me on the town's website. Okay. You can, you can check the ones you want to receive. You know, you can check all, you can just check. I just want to hear snow emergencies. I don't want to hear anything else. Um, oh. and I think when people get their parking permits, they do get a notification about how to sign up for alerts and things like that. But do they do ones that go right to your phone and not your email too? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sean, can you tell Judy and whoever else is listening um, where on the town website she would go to sign up for something like that? Paul may be better at uh, explaining <laughs> that. Or actually, Brianna, Brianna, our communications uh, director, would probably be the best. Um, is it under the calendar, Paul? No. Um... I'm trying to remember too. And so I so if, you, if you if you go to the home home page, oh, stay connected under how do I? Yeah, how do yes. I? Stay so if you, if you click on how do I at the top, there's a um, stay connected subheading, and then under stay connected, there's subscribe. Yeah, and I think. But that's there's also can... a banner. There's a lot of little buttons on that flow through that you can just click stay connected as well. Yeah, yeah. staying connected is important. It's a good thing. Yeah. So Judy, since 
you got a link to this meeting from your friend Trudy, um, it means that that we don't have your email address, so we can't include you when we notice people about this meeting. And if you want to, if you want to be included in our updates or whatever else information coming from Anika and myself, you can write to our council address, and it's um, it's Rooney P at AmherstMa.gov or Lopes A at AmherstMa.gov. She's got a piece of paper coming. And again, please. Sure. It's just my last name, Rooney, first initial P at AmherstMa.gov. And just say, Pam, please put just please put me on your email list. Okay. And then you get the link directly and you don't have to rely on anybody else. Okay, good. Thank you. Excellent. Do you have any questions about sidewalks or street lights or anything like that since we're here? Not really. No. You mentioned Heatherstone Street. I drive on that very often and it's horrible shape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was not on the original list. So I no. don't know. That's one of those things that blew up pretty frequently recently. Okay. But other than that, I don't have any comments. We're really glad that you stuck with us to the end. <laughs> um, seeing no other hand. Yeah, I think we should let everybody go home. <laughs> I, think, I think so too. Log off, a lot of heavy so hitters I wanna, here. I wanna, so. I wanna say thank you to Trudy and then thanks to Paul and Sean and Lynn for joining us. Thank you. And I feel badly that we had such a small audience, but the people who did show up were it's interested. Good. But I do appreciate that it is listed on the town calendar online. Yeah. Because I know sometimes the district meetings aren't there. So. Yeah, exactly. But again, it's one of those things about people who know, know, and people. <laughs> so right. anyway, but thank you. Thank you both for having it. So. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Thank, thank you, Anika. Bye, all. Okay. All right. We're going out tonight. Good night. Lynn, before you leave, yeah. um, do you do you hit the stop recording button? No, I just hit leave and that okay. ends it. Okay? okay. It cuts all of you off and you're done. Okay. okay.